You know, in our profession, on a personal note, um, you know, there are great orators, there's great organizers, there's great transactional leaders and transformational leaders. Um, but a real skill in our profession and with the challenges that we have ahead of us that create the opportunities that Dr. Wisniewski has laid out requires a leader who is able to bridge the gap in understanding between the differences in the delivery systems. And I can tell you from my personal experience, uh, having known Jerry for a while and 30 years in the profession and as a leader in this profession, that Dr. Jerry Klum, without a doubt, is in my opinion, the single greatest professional diplomat we have in our profession. And I thank you for that, Jerry, very, very much. Appreciate it. Look forward to many more years of your service and working together at life. Thank you, sir. So where do we go from what we just heard? Whole health approach. It's a big topic. You know, the World Health Organization has about 17 different domains within this concept. And we sit here as chiropractors looking at the breadth of the ways to, to influence whole health. And at some point in time, we've got to pull back and go, okay, so what's the chiropractic opportunity within this whole health, health conversation? And if you haven't already been slapped across the face over the last couple of years, we have been positioned in society now, having come out of the dialogues that have been going on and the, and the conversations and the pressures that have been forced upon society through governmental actions and deliberations and politics, to know that our communities are ripe for a conversation that isn't necessarily led by the traditional drugs and surgery approach to providing health. There's been an awakening of the mind of our consumers in healthcare to possibly a different way through the actions of people who are having those conversations. And that, I think, is our true opportunity as a profession. It's the territory that we've already owned, a domain that we've embraced historically, but it's our opportunity to really take, the, 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 take advantage of what this societal environment has created for us professionally moving forward. So we're calling this topic today, Resiliency of Life. But the question I have is, what the heck is resiliency? I mean, Dr. Wisniewski talked about resiliency, and it's used in a whole lot of context. In fact, if you're watching the news just right now after the hurricane blew through Florida, you hear the word a lot, the folks are so resilient. The resiliency of people who've had these types of traumas and their ability to be able to adjust to those circumstances and come out of that storm are truly remarkable. But it's not just the ability to bounce back, is it? It's certainly a component of that, but it's the capacity to adapt in the face of challenges while maintaining that sense of kind of whole well-being. So this idea of resiliency is really important to us. It's also important to realize that this isn't just you know, an individual trait that somebody either has or doesn't have. It's not like a genetic predisposition in the terms of the genome project where you either have it or you don't have it. It's something that can actually be built and nurtured and acquired through a lifespan so that somebody's resiliency and their ability to respond to external and internal challenges is already inherently within them. Wouldn't you agree? So there are skills and behaviors that can be learned through this project that will allow people and prepare people to be resilient so that they can not just maintain a state of optimal health or whole health, but they're able to be in a position to prevent poor health or ill health in that particular context moving forward. We see it everywhere, this resiliency concept, the ability to bounce back. We all have individuals in our lives who have gone through traumatic events, health events. Why is it that two individuals can be diagnosed within the conventional healthcare system with the exact same diagnosis? yet one succumbs to it and one doesn't. What is it about the constitution of an individual that allows them to have a different outcome? You know, I used that story of the Broad Street Well in London in the Soho district back in the 17th century, where those individuals started to become very sick, having dysentery, and die. 
And then that James Snow, the medical doctor in that particular area, who's the father of kind of the idea of pathogenetic ill health, was the one who determined through a very, very thoughtful, deliberate, intelligent process that has become the foundation for reductionistic science, the idea that the similarity that everybody had in common was that they were drinking from the Broad Street well. And in that well, he identified the cholera bacteria for the first time. And their solution to it was to prevent people from drinking the infested water. And they took the handle off the well, which saved thousands of lives. But if we'd asked a different question, about what is it about the constitution of an individual who drank the cholera-infested water and didn't become sick, we'd be having a very different conversation. We'd be having a conversation that actually relates to the topic of today's sessions, this idea of resiliency, the internal constitution of an individual. And resiliency is just not something we talk about now. It adapts to and affects every stage of an individual's life. It's through multiple domains of the human experience. So from prenatal to natal to you know, you know, newborns to adolescents to adulthood to seniors, resiliency is something that will affect that journey throughout the entire lifespan. So today's session, what we want to do is we're going to provide a series of speakers who are going to take this concept of resiliency through different presentations and different stages of development. And we're going to provide topics on the clinical application of chiropractic in the context of resiliency. And then we're going to have an individual provide the current level of scientific validation and, and science that supports our concepts moving forward and try to bridge those together. Does that sound reasonable? It's going to be a fascinating conversation. But I want to share with you some historical concepts. Because really, you know, we're going to take some of these new terms and concepts, but everything we're talking about is chiropractic philosophy. And we need to realize this. I still, to this day, remember being in Minnesota, where a leader of the American Chiropractic Association stood in front of us in Minnesota and said this two words, more than two words. You can't let philosophy get in the way of politics. And I remember that so vividly because in my mind, I understood politics to actually be a branch of philosophy. So not only can it not get in the way of it, you have to understand that your politics is your philosophy through your view of life, how you know that to be, how you express it through your morals and ethics, how you frame it politically, and how you then express it through your trade and profession. That is, Paul, that is philosophy. So we have a tendency to say we can't think about this, but come back to it. The 33 principles talk about what we are talking about. It's the fundamental concept of adaptation. We are all inherently, our journey is the ability for us to adapt. Wouldn't you agree? And not only does the 33 principles talk about it, but Stevenson's got all kinds of stuff that talks about it. You know, the signs of life, the fine sight, one of the signs of life is adaptability. Right? Goes through different articles talking about adaptation and the influence of that. We always say about, you know, when I'm 2005, when I moved from, from Canada to Minnesota and came down to, to Marietta, Georgia in July of 2005, it was about 110 degrees and 90% humidity, and I literally thought I was going to die. And I would have if I didn't have this amazing ability to adapt to the external stimuli internally. Wouldn't you agree? We're talking about the ability to be able to assess and monitor stimuli and adapt to those responses so that we can reduce the stresses acting on our body. You know, my mom died when she was 69, 26 years ago. One month shy of her 70th birthday. My dad passed when he was 93. And coincidentally, they both succumbed to the same condition. It's called FA. Have you heard of it? FA. See, despite one having cardiovascular disease on a death certificate and the other having metastatic prostatic cancer, they both died of what I call as the leading cause of death globally, failure to adapt. 
Because that's what it is. It's when the processes are unable to keep up with the external stimuli and challenges, and we can't adapt any longer. It's a fascinating concept, isn't it? And then we get into the issues. I think I have it at the bottom of that last slide, if it goes back, of survival values. How many people remember constructive and destructive survival values in the chiropractic philosophy world? Fascinating construct. It's this way of being able to know that, you know, innate intelligence is 100% and prerequisite to its needs. And this idea of kind of assessing and balancing these entropies and things that create constructive survival values, which are the values that are positive in our lives and affect us positively, and destructive survival values, which are the ones that break things down. And the entire planet is in this global cycle of destructive and constructive survival values, and so are we. And when we start talking about this concept of adaptation, it's essentially some sort of an equation where the net sum of destructive and constructive survival values is the outcome. It's either positive or it's negative, and how your body is going to be able to adapt to those stressors that are being placed on you. Does that make sense to you? And the way we can adapt can be through so many different things, but I'm asking us, what is the chiropractic role in that adaptation process? Now, that's our historical concept, but I also want to bring us into some contemporary terms before we move forward with our speakers. See, Life University is founded on this concept of vitalism, the self-conscious, self-organizing, self-maintaining, and self-healing ability of living systems. But there's this concept called autopoiesis that has been around for a while, which in its scientific language is almost the same thing. I mean, if we really want to stop talking, you know, the jargon and things that we get caught up in, there's this concept called autopoiesis. It's a property of all living systems, whether it's a cell or a living system, that allows it to maintain and renew itself by regulating its composition and conserving its boundaries. So that a single cell has within its ability a self-awareness to be able to assess what's going on in that cell and to be able to maintain itself, reorganize itself, and heal itself within the boundaries of its membrane. It's a very established scientific process. So I'm sitting here going, okay, it sounds like we may be using some of these elements in how we move forward in our conversations about the body's ability to adapt. There's another conversation going on right now that's really pertinent to this, and Dr. Wisniewski teed it up perfectly, this dichotomy between the pathogenic model and the salutogenic model of health. Now, if you're not familiar with these, I want you to become familiar with these because as he was talking about with the pathologies and the global burdens of diseases and all the, all the things that are diagnosed is the conventional healthcare delivery system that we're living in promotion and education and prevention of the onset of a, of a pathological condition. But on the opposite side of that continuum is really the whole health conversation, this ability for us to be able to say, what are the aspects of healthful living that allow us to per express health to our fullest potential. That's really the conversation we're having as chiropractors, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, we do a great job on low back pain and neck pain. There's lots of evidence to support that. It's a $130 billion problem in this country, and we should embrace it. But you know, the chiropractic adjustment and having a healthy spine and nervous system does a lot more for people than just get rid of low back pain. It actually allows people who are sick to get better. It allows people who are otherwise healthy to stay well. And here's the really holy grail. It gets people to whole new levels of health that they've never experienced before. Man, do we need that right now? You betcha we do. So salutogenesis is that model. It's our conversation in this approach. It's not talking about how to diagnose and treat conditions. It's not about measuring high blood pressure, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, COPD. You know, the list goes on and on and on. Although those are certainly indicators and tools we can use in monitoring the body's adaptive ability moving forward. I always say physiology is the window to innate intelligence. It is. I mean, if we're talking about your body's ability to adapt, then maybe we can use physiology to actually watch and measure our body's ability to adapt. What an interesting concept that would be, huh? That's why people like Fred Barge and those had people peeing in cups so they could do a quick test to see the body's ability to adapt. 
So it's really not a conversation about that. It's how do you promote people to be able to go to expressing health to their fullest potential, the whole health conversation. And what's interesting within these salutogenic theory is this, it's this concept called generalized resource deficits, right? So we battle stresses all the time, externally through the environment and toxins and internally through the toxins within our systems and thoughts and traumas. And we battle these and these stressors have this name that's tagged to them, generalized resource deficits. But when you start getting into something called generalized resistance resources, these are the mechanisms by which we use to create resiliency in people's lives throughout their lifespan. And it gets to the areas that Len was talking about in his talk, but you know, your views of life would play tremendously into this if you have a vitalistic view of life or whether you have a, a kind of a victim's view of you know, the genetic model of care. Knowledge, experience, all play into how you live your life moving forward. Nice little visual of what this model is. The poor people swimming and going over the waterfall is the conventional medical system. And you've heard the fence on the cliff poem from 1905, which essentially is the ambulance down in the valley or the fence on the cliff. Which do you take? Why do you put a fence on the cliff? An ambulance down in the valley when you could put a fence on the cliff. That's the approach we have on this, but if we change our thinking on this and start to take the salutogenic approach to this, then we're having a different conversation. We're talking about empowerment determinants for people to take control of their life moving forward. Dr. Wisniewski, it's a coincidence that he talked about this because these presentations were put together before Len's video came in, so the fact that he was talking about it was somewhat serendipitous. So there's a bunch of factors of health, and I'm not going to get into all of these, but you know that people's health is subject to a lot of different factors, right? Socioeconomic factors, their access to chiropractic care or, or, or trauma care, uh, the availability of food sources, the environments they live in can all be extremely challenging to somebody's ability to express health fully. But they have a way of breaking these down that I want to share with you before we introduce speakers, because it's really kind of fascinating. They have what they call distal determinants of health, which are on that little wheel right there. They're the things I've just talked about. You can read those for yourself. And then they have things that are called proximal determinants of health. So the distals are political factors, and you can kind of see the issues that go around the outside that are very external. And the proximal are the things that are a little closer to home. And the one thing I want to show with you on this is that one of these proximal determinants of health, obviously the demography is there in physical environment and lifestyles and socioeconomic, but at the very top of that, there's that one. The constitution of its host. Think about this. These aren't my words, by the way, folks. We're, gonna have, we're having a conversation now about the constitution of the host. It's the same question I said about the Broad Street well. Why can two people drink the same infested water and one person gets sick and die and the other doesn't? What is it about the host constitution that affects that? Deepak Chopra always said, seeds are blown by the wind, but they don't take root until the terrain is ready to receive them, right? Until the host, until the net difference between constructive and destructive survival values are there so the susceptibility of the host is responsive to it and it starts to reflect a state of ill health. You can see how this applies to everything. The COVID situation that we went through, why people, why somebody who can smoke a pack of cigarettes and drink a handle of scotch and doesn't do any exercise and watches TV 15 hours a day can get through that kind of thing despite all those external stressors that you would think would be destructive survival values in this concept but still had no effect with an external pathogen coming into their system. What is it about that individual? The susceptibility of the host is important. I'm giving Dr. Plasker a shameless plug here because the fastest growing population in the United States is centenarians, people who are living to be 100 years old or older. And we've got two choices. We can have a whole growing population of individuals living to be 100 years old who are disabled and sick and decrepit, or we can have a whole group of individuals who are living to be 100 plus 
who are vibrant and healthy and enjoying life to their fullest. What's your choice? Somewhat of a rhetorical question, wouldn't you agree? But so pertinent to our conversation of whole health and chiropractic's role in that. See, I'm training for the Centenarian Olympics right now. Does anybody know what the Centenarian Olympics is? So I'll tell you what it is. At 61 years old, if I'm going to live to be 100, right, God willing, there's some things I want to be able to do. Now, Dr. LaMarche wants to set a Masters 400 running record, what he's working on, God bless him, but I'm not there. Done that. Not going to do that. But I do want to do some things. I want to be able to squat down and lift up grandkids and hold them, right? I want to be able to get up out of my chair or off the floor with just one hand. I want to be able to hike and travel and enjoy life to the fullest potential. So I'm going to start training for that, literally training for that. And those activities that are necessary to achieve those simple things that I want to be able to do at those lives are very different than what Dr. LaMarche is doing. You see, trying to train and having a, a life of longevity and exercise and activity and lifestyles for longevity are very, very different than exercise and training for performance, right? For running a three-minute mile or senior running. And in fact, those are, can be very destructive on the survival. It's actually a paradoxical relationship that individuals who try to do training for performance are actually damaging their adaptive abilities as opposed to individuals who are training and having exercise for longevity, which are the simple aspects of just being able to live a healthy life. Interesting? So this idea that the chiropractic adjustment by identifying, analyzing, and correcting vertebral subluxations to have people with healthy spines and functioning nerve systems so that the master controlling system of the body's ability to monitor, regulate, and adapt is intact is a pretty powerful concept. Wouldn't you agree? And as we move forward as a profession and we build our body of science in this concept, which we have a lot of work to do still, despite the level of good science that's available to us to support our premise, we can have a tangibly different impact on society through the simple process of identifying, correcting nerve interference through the chiropractic adjustment and the other ancillary aspects that can affect whole health if you choose to do them within your office. But by simply doing that and allowing that body to communicate in its simplest form, so we give people the hope of being able to express their health to their fullest potential, whatever that potential is within their body.